Okay, uh, just to explain why we've got these three companies on stage. Uh, We've got, you know, the, first of all, they're, they're all three have uh, quite a bit of scale, uh, are innovators in their respective fields. But the, the, I think the three companies who stand out to me uh, who have come into the space and are approaching digital as it is today. Uh, I think they're, they're, they, they don't have too much legacy baggage. Maybe can't Photoshop, but that's, that's, I don't think that's legacy baggage as such. Um, and uh, yeah, they've developed products for. The, the market, like I said, as it stands today. So, Amir, I'm going to start with you. Uh, it's always fun to pick an next center. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think earlier today we were joking with Dave Simon from Oath and saying, you know, we have this thing about, you know, are you a tech company, are you a media company, and it's this sort of, you know, perennial argument. Uh, but I, I think we've got a similar thing with Accenture at the moment, where, um, you know, are you a consultancy or are you an agency? Um, and, yeah. So, um, I think that Accenture is essentially evolving as we speak. Um, and part of the evolution is a response to a market demand. Um, so I would say that, you know, advertising isn't traditionally been a core uh, area of Accenture. Uh, everyone knows that. Um, but what the observation has been is that businesses, huge businesses, um, from the likes of Google, Facebook, uh, Apple, etc., cetera, um, right down to, you know, your everyday brands are... Um, curious about the developments of uh, technology in advertising. And I think Accenture has a history of integration, um, kind of data architecture, consultancy and strategy ac around transformation, making your business ready in, you know, for the future of uh, consumption from digital devices, etc. And advertising has become an area of interest, um, namely because the ad tech sector is colliding into you know, the, the clients, um, into the client's uh, infrastructure. So we're seeing that clients are adopting DMPs, they're experimenting with DSPs, taking control over uh, their marketing communications and customer communications, existing customer database. Um, and it's raised lots of questions like uh, keeping their data in, in, in a safe environment, not sharing that outside of their own uh, domain. And Accenture's become a kind of force uh, for um, well, catalyzing those capabilities and those areas of interest within, within clients. And I think that we're well positioned to do that as well. But we definitely see boutique consultancies on the ground as well. You know, people that have got experience of ad tech that, that are not working for a traditional ag agency or, or business. But, but, but is, it about, is it about, you know, disintermediating, disintermediating the agencies? You know, is it about cut, cutting them out? No. Or is it about... Is it about partnership? Yeah. yeah, well, so I think that the, the, the media is interpreting the move as a disintermediation uh, effort, but I think the reality is is that it's a response to the clients, right? So, um, you know, Google offer an end-to-end -end stack, you know, Google D DBM, Google AdWords, Google Cloud, um, and these products are products that, you know, clients are interested in using. How can it give them more information about their customers? How can it activate a, a better <laughs> communication strategy for them? And, and you know, they are... They're filled with people that have the ambition to learn more about this space, and somebody has to quench that thirst um, and hunger. And I think that, you know, we, the acquisition of Karma Rama, obviously um, a creative agency, um, is because we believe that that communications effectiveness um, is something that we, we want to, to help them evolve as well. So you have the media efficiency piece, you know, media optimization, buy and supply, like media agencies do. But you also have to look at, you know, the content of it. So there's been lots of emphasis on, you know, um, the right user at the right time for terms of targeting. But what about the right ad and the, the, the actual content of that communication? So Karma Rama has really helped shape that proposition. Takara, I'm going to jump down to you. Uh, so you're uh, of, you were a Tube Mogul stock originally, weren't you, before the acquisition? Mm -hmm. you were? Yeah. Um, and I think both, both Tube Mogul and Adobe have very much uh, touted their brand direct relationship. So looking ahead five years, uh, will we, you know, are, are we seeing, is the trend towards buying actually going in-house? Because, you know, here, you hear big specialists. Of course, you, you hear brands doing it. Uh, many people predict, often agencies, in fairness, uh, that they will fail and they will return to agencies. Um, how well are clients coping today with in-house and is it a trend that you expe expect to see grow in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, um, a lot of brands that we talk to or marketers, are, they're thinking about it. They're exploring how do we get started? Um, what do we need? Um, and, um, you know, in, in five years, I think we'll see a mix, right? So with a, a lot of 
e-commerce companies or digital first companies. They have people that are very smart and that they can start to build their own in-house teams or they're probably already doing it before. Um, maybe some of the more traditional companies, um, a lot of their relationships that they have with agencies and, and you know some of the, the buying strength that agencies provide, like that's really still important. And so it's figuring out how to navigate that. But I don't necessarily know if Everyone, I don't think everyone's going to be in house. One, because we don't have the talent <laughs> to to kind of do, to do that um, across the board. But but two, um, it's it's very complex. It's a very complex journey. There are a lot of dependencies, um, and there are a lot of areas that um, that advertisers just need to to consider um, internally. There are various teams that um, or internal stakeholders that own different parts of technology um, that will allow them to build a really strong, um, you know, in-house solution. Um, there are people that own the analytics side. There's you know DMP sort of experts. There are people that own buying. So they need to figure out what they're doing internally and kind of create, um, you know, a a sort of a path to get there if that's what they're interested in doing. And then ex externally, they also need to start to consider what those relationships that they have with their external partners look like. So do I actually own the contract um, with all of my technology partners? Do I understand all the people that we work with? Do we own that? Um, and then sort of what's the role and the responsibility of us versus our external partners? So, I mean, five years from now, we'll probably see more, um, I would say a, a little bit more um, advertisers than we do now, maybe that have an in-house element to it. Um, but I don't think we'll necessarily see everybody have, have it all in-house at all. I mean, just hypothetically, you know, we're starting to see sort of creaking and groaning from the, the, the large agency holding groups at the moment. Uh, particularly, it's sort of crossed over into uh, financial results now. Um, what do agencies need to, to to do to survive? What what's the what's the fix for the agencies? What does the the agency of the future look like? Uh, I don't know, Brian, do you have any view on that? I mean, I know you're you're taking this, the sell side view, and you, you love all people with money, but exactly. Um, what, what do you think has been the the sort of main problem for, for the agencies? Well, I mean, we're an agency shop, right? So, you know, we're gonna we're gonna work with all constituents in the media buying and the planning process. Uh, we work with clients uh, very early in the planning process, using our uh, understanding people through music concept um, to help them identify uh, music strategies, artists to align with, um, particular crossovers that particular segments uh, may have interest in. Um, I've got one advertiser right now that wants to align with a particular artist and we provided some data on what that audience and what they like to do and and in different geographic areas where people tend to like that type of artist and that can inform their creative strategy and how they program uh, events um, you know um, with their service right so you know there, there's buying there's planning there's all these different aspects of, of getting a media campaign live uh, there's various constituents that are going to, um, to to focus on each step of it um, you know from a buying perspective, we want to make our inventory easy to buy, easy to understand, uh, easy to report back results on. Um, and for, for clients, that usually is a little bit more high touch, um, but we want to provide solutions for each one. So, I mean, I mean you are the, the, you know, the, the quintessential data-driven publisher. Um, how do your, you know, what are your advertisers looking for? Are, are, are they there with you? Are they generally looking for, is it more of a performance focus because you've got that, that data angle? Sure. Or do you get the spray and pray money as well? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You know, Dave Simon's presentation this morning was great, right? And talked about the evolution of, uh, you know, print media companies evolving to digital and TV, traditional TV companies evolving to digital video, right? I'm probably the only publisher up here that started as a, a pure play audio platform that is now evolving into audio and visual and even interactive components. Um, so as a, you know, a large music streamer, you know, we have over 150 million monthly active users, 60 million of them paying now in our 11th year as a, as a, as a global company. Um, users come to us um, because of this, um, we have this kind of cultural sense and this cultural pulse all around music. So um, you know, we want to be able to provide users you know, deeper and more uh, compelling reasons to discover new content, explore new genres and cultures, uh, learn more and, uh, and, and find new artists and, and experience it in, in more profound ways. Uh, for advertisers, they want to connect with those advertisers that are, or with those users that are spending a tremendous amount of time on platform per day. 
uh, and learn more about their moods and their mindsets that really only music can, can provide that information of. Amir, you've uh, jumped ship from the, uh, the publisher world. Um, yeah, or we have uh, your old buddies from Trinity Mirror on uh, stage earlier on today alongside Telegraph and Axel Springer. Um, publishers, are, are they in as much of a crisis as, as we're led to believe, or do you think that there's be hope for them over you know, the next sort of five years or so? Um, I, think, yeah, I think publishers do face a crisis. Um, it's not coming, it's here. Uh, but I do. Also, I'm optimistic about the the um, that they can they can get past it. I think that the media owners who you know invest hundreds of millions of dollars into content, you know, like producing quality journalism, etc., um, especially in the news category space where I've got experience, don't have a kind of Ofcom regulated uh, virtuous quality that you know like TV channels do, for instance, um, and therefore that their inventory is being clumped with a whole host of crap, you know, and, 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 and being priced at the same way. I think that's a problem. Um, I think that there is, a, looking at the presentations earlier and the general voice, I mean, I've seen like a dozen iterations of that dollar to a couple of cents slide, mm. right, where the margin's lost and optimizing the value chain. Um, there's a real case to, to accelerate that, um, that transparency because you're actually going to do it for the purpose and betterment of... of, of uh, of uh, publishers and, and if you want to go online and access you know free content they need to have ads that substantiate the uh, the content they produce um, I think as TV businesses move digital there is definitely a fear in that and you know broadcasters are looking at the uh, the transition and incorporation of programmatic into their space they want to ensure that it doesn't happen like it did for the big publishers mm -hmm. before before programmatic it was all IO direct base so it's fixed CPMs high CPMs, and then suddenly they're like, oh, well, we can't fill all our inventory, so let's just turn on this RTB down below and mm. see what happens. Mm -hmm. And then what happened was all the agencies got DSPs and they could access the inventory for 50p, and all the direct just went, you know. Mm. And I think that there's, there has to be a, um, there has to be a, a, a reinvigoration across the agencies to invest in, in and to understand the virtue of that content. And, and advertisers and brands need to understand that they, the value of having their brands in those environments. Mm. That's one of the, the, the things that I do at Accenture. I mean, you were talking about earlier about aligning yourself to artists um, as a brand. I think that's amazing. You'd be surprised how many CMOs um, and how many client-side marketeers want to, to have those conversations yep. with you. And, um, and they just have never had those conversations with media suppliers, mm -hmm. right? So I think that, you know, if... Uh, Looking at Trinity Mirror, the regional um, assets they have are really powerful, right? In Scotland, in Liverpool Echo, um, Cambridge News, these assets are powerful, and, and brands want to get that regionality, but they need to have conversations directly with these publishers, I think. Um, until the brand, someone in the brand, says to an agency, I think that you know our brand should be aligned with, uh, I don't know, Lady Gaga's music, right? You're not really going to be approached with that conversation. Um, and I have dozens of conversations with brands who are saying, well, I think we should be on Snapchat or we should be reaching social media influencers, um, you know, and we should be, um, you know, across the Telegraph or we should be across um, The Economist. And, and this is the, the thought processes they're having, but they don't really have those conversations. But because of technology, the portfolio of the CMO is changing and the ability to pull a report from a DSP that shows you what websites your ads are landing on is um, definitely going to kind of disrupt what we've seen previously. Takara, you've got, you've got a great view of what, what buyers are looking for. Uh, you know, are, again, I ask this to the publisher panel. You know, are, are buyers really willing to pay for premium, or have they sort of got hooked on the, the crack pipe of cheap inventory, which is being supplied often by robots? Um, I mean, I think you, what I see is there's uh, there's definitely you know some people that are still looking at you know, just efficiency, um, because it is important and you need to ensure that you are 
you know, kind of looking at that and, and looking at ROI. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, a lot of the conversations that we're having with um, brands and also with people at agencies is just how do we start to move away from some of these metrics that don't necessarily tell us anything um, and, and really start to use technology and use the data that we have available to um, sort of validate um, how um, investment in premium environments can really give a return on, you know, metrics that actually matter towards someone's business. So it's looking at, you know, for retail, how does it drive people in store? Um, when, when you're surrounding premium environments or how does it drive people to um, purchase whether it's online or offline and how do we start to connect various data sources to fully understand that and then to also um, attribute you know different channels correctly so I, I mean people hear programmatic and maybe um, some people still think like efficiency or remnant or bottom barrel inventory but that's not what it is and that's not really the full promise of programmatic or technology it really is and, and this is what we talk about a lot um, kind of at Tubogol and now at Adobe with AdCloud is that it, it, it really is software that can help your overarching business and answer some of the questions that you've had maybe in your head that you didn't necessarily know how to get to. Now, it doesn't mean that we have answered all of those questions nor that we know how to do it, but we do spend time working with various partners and finding different data sources or other partners that we can leverage to help us start to start to figure that out. Um, and, and the other piece I think is, is you know, Specifically with TV, um, you know, we started programmatic TV um, in in the U.S. Uh, about two years ago. But initially, what we had to do is really talk through the value to broadcasters and, and really help them to to get there and understand that we're not here to just price your inventory cheaply. It's actually to allow you to drive strategic targeting where you can ask for higher prices and start to start to do more interesting things than you haven't before. Um, so it, it, it has required multiple conversations across various stakeholders. Um, but in general, what I'm seeing is that people are, are seeing the value of software and of these tools and, and they want to get out of things like just a completion rate or a click-through rate or just these, these other metrics. And so they really do want to start looking at high-level metrics. Well, are, are there other sort of uh, dynamics in the industry that, that sort of um, push the industry in the wrong direction at times? You know, for example, I, you know, I heard somebody talking about an agency they were speaking to recently who was saying, oh, you know, raging about ads.txt and how he wasn't able to flog supposedly ft.com inventory for a quid to his client who was impressed with the fact that he was buying it. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm buying it for a pound. And um, isn't there a sort of a, a lot, you know, and then on the brand side, again, we've got other incentives where, um, and this was a big feature of the ATS conference this year, uh, where procurement is often working on the brand side and they're, and they're driving price, price, price. Low. I heard, again, another anecdote of a brand wanting viewability technology taken off their campaign because the, the brand guy's bonus was based on him getting the CPM down. So he knew he was buying shit, but he was happy to, to do it. I, he yeah, I think you make a valuable point. I think that the, um, the reality is, is that programmatic has been the gift of a special few, and actually you've seen a whole host of bad behaviours evolve. And it's, it's important to root out these bad behaviours, right? And if um, you know, the, the, the parties involved can't get their act together, then they will just find themselves losing business, right? And so you've got, the you've got to have a cultural shift in the use of programmatic um, to ensure that, as, as you mentioned, that, it, it, that it's being used um, for premium and brand and, um, and to its full effect, not being a source to penny pinch or to drive, as you said, hey, I can get this for a pound or a hacking mm. kind of approach to programmatic, yeah. right? And so most of the, you know, most of the, the, the talent kind of vacuum is the problem that, that, you know, there's not many people that know the programmatic industry very well, but that will change, that will evolve very quickly, actually, I think. I think you'll see, I do believe you'll see client-side uh, expertise scaling up. The existential question that clients can't attract talent is unfounded from what we can see. You take the 40 biggest telcos, broadcasters, online retailers, Amazon, etc., and you tell me that they can't attract talent, I mean, you're, 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 you're mistaken. Um, so I think that you've just got to see that good behavior standardized across the in industry. Um, but I mean, that, that, that example you gave really annoys me about the, the one pound of Financial Times. I mean, they're both idiots. So the, the, the agency is an idiot and the client because that's just destruct, destroying the, the, the general industry. The guy that removed Moat from 
the platform. That's you know, this is a totally unregulated industry, mm. right? So that's it's basically saying I'm willing to just spend on ads that are not seen. Because I make personal money is often the case. Yeah, it's, t- it's tantamount money. to it's a fraudulent yeah. behaviour, which is, is just is crazy. But in, in general, I see people though like there's some clients where they are scared and they kind of hide from <laughs> seeing the truth, which you're like what the hell, like, okay, but they probably have internal sort of goals and things that they need to align with that don't allow them to necessarily um, maybe, you know, look at viewability or track viewability or they're worried about kind of their jobs. And so for, on the one hand, it's up to them to sort of have that internal conversation and really educate people and walk them through this. But, you know, maybe they don't have time or they're just you know, kind of freaking out. And then you have other people that freak out on the other end where they're like, I need everything to be 100% viewable. I need to, we need to see this, we need to see that. And they have all these sort of rules that must happen that you're like, well, this isn't actually real. Like we can't, we can't do this. But as long as we know and we use the tools to ensure that we're reaching humans and that they're able to see the ads and we have the right third party verification in place, well then we can start to explore how we ensure that you guys are running in brand safe environments and then how that actually relates back to what matters. The challenges are fascinating and complicated, but it can be summarized as you get what you pay for. Right? Yeah. So, you know, if, if you want to be guaranteed you're reaching a real person in a viewable environment and it's brand safe, you can't get that for 10 bucks. Mm. It, nowhere. No, you just can't buy it. Um, and if the agency wants to take the risk, right, of ending up on the Times of London, right, then, you know, that's the risk you're going to have to take. But I think clients are wising up to the fact that, you know, uh, you know, premium content is in short supply, but, you know, there's, there's a price to pay for that, especially mm-hmm. once you start adding viewability guarantees toward that. I think your yield right? must be really strong at Spotify, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, but, I mean, is there, is there... I mean, I think we've sort of gone down a, a sort of negative path, but, but I think... It, it, I, I'm starting to get the sense that real action... I think the Mark Pritchard speech was a bit of a tipping point, even yeah. though, you know, brands do mouth off every once in a while and they've got their own incentives. Um, but it did feel like a bit of a tipping point. This year has felt like there's a lot of progress. Ads up Texas it's going to be a big thing in terms of cleaning up the resellers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm noticing a lot of the resellers are, are less inclined to come along, along to our conferences anymore, so, uh, which they all used to. Well, I had a CMO who's responsible for a $5 billion P&L just yesterday, <laughs> uh, the opportunity to meet this person. And they asked me, they said, um, do you know what Critio is? And I said, yeah, and said, can we do what Critio do ourselves? And I was like, flabbergasted, right? So this person's like a, a veteran of, of the industry in advertising and, and went on to say, well, I want to explore that capability, right? Let's set up an innovation hub and let's kick the tires on it. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I can't say who the client is, but I mean, I think you're right. I think that the, the, the optimistic approach is going to be that the econ- it all boils back down to econometric and where the money sits, if the people sitting on that sack of money are curious about developing uh, new capabilities, it will absolutely... Um, change and just destroy, as you said, what has existed in this market. It's not seeing the resellers around ad tech investment kind of drying up, et cetera. Um, the, the, you know, what's been the status quo for a few years. You use the word, uh, uh, refer to econometrics, which doesn't, isn't something we talk about at conferences often enough. Uh, we're very wedded to our digital metrics, which are quite uh, yeah. ridiculous half the time. Um, yeah. yeah. So on, on the measurement side, do you th- where do we need to go from here in terms of making sure are, is the is true attribution where you know you, you can see all the touch points and allocate what did what is that anywhere close or is this still a fantasy that we're going to talk about at conferences well i think the mobile phone has, has really shifted the dial on that capability mm-hmm. and uh, and and i think that you know the metrization of advertising as clicks and ctr as you said is um is actually shifting because people are thinking, well, what does this tell me about what my TV campaign is doing, that my brand is doing, and the, 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 the out-of-home advertising I'm doing? How can I know that that's adding value to the conversion? Right? And so there has to be this evaluation cycle that is set up for, for clients, and they want to own that as well. They don't want the people executing that marking their own homework. They want to mark the homework of the media buyers. So, I mean, it's, 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 this is full-level disruption right this is complete disruption of what's happened before that's my belief mm. you know it's not about an ex- it's not an Accenture thing we're not you know there's not that's something Accenture or Deloitte are doing it's the clients are fundamentally changing the way they view marketing mm. 
and and you know you can embrace that and, and you can you know get a lot of success out of it. Yeah. Um, jumping onto the 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 TV industry, where do you think the TV industry is going to be in, in five years' time? Is this is again? Brian, I think you'd be you know, one of the companies who would be, uh, you know, I wouldn't say you know, you're necessarily the TV disruptor, but you're mm -hmm. pres assume, presumably going after the same pockets of money. Um, what do you think the TV industry's prospects are? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting you picked 2022. Obviously, it's five years from now, but mm. um, at least in the U.S., it's going to be a pivotal year because that's when the rights for the NFL expire with all the major pub yeah, yeah. publishers. So ESPN, for example, uh, spends $1.9 billion a year to broadcast uh, Monday Night Football. CBS is a little over a billion. NBC is over a little billion. You know, a little company like Amazon is now in the game, right? And they're only spent 50 million, and Twitter has spent uh, less than that. But that's going to be that could really shake things up, right? Now, you know, the English Premier League was was recently renegotiated here. There was, you know, um, you know, some discussion whether Amazon was going to bid into that. But I think uh, these sports leagues have gotten very, very expensive. And the way people are consuming them is definitely changing. TV ratings for English Premier League are down in the UK. The NFL ratings are down again in the US. People are consuming them uh, on a variety of different devices. Um, so I think in 2022, you're going to see much more content. Right? We've got an insatiable desire to consume video entertainment, whether it's scripted or live or, um, or professionally produced or user generated. I think you're going to see more devices, right? Amazon Alexa now has a new device at the spot, which is this kind of creepy little circular device, which is going on sale in December. But popping those things around, you're going to have video everywhere, right? So I think both of those trends are going to um, explode fragmentation. So it'll be harder and harder to find mass audiences. Uh, it's going to make things really, really complicated. So we're going to be having these same discussions around common currency metrics, people-based marketing, uh, third-party attribution, things like that. Um, but it'll you know it'll keep us going on the uh, on the on the circuit for quite a while. <laughs> we're just we're under, under quite a bit of pressure. I think there's another event uh, due in here fairly soon, so we've got to uh, be, be very speedy, very okay. quickly on TV. What's yeah, uh, well, I, I agree. Like we're going to see a lot more content, and there's uh, sort of who knows what device will come in five years. God knows, um, or what else the other thing is going to pop up. But I think what we're we're also seeing those. Um, <laughs> All of the um, broadcasters or all the companies are starting to look at how do we start, how do we pull this data together, how do we understand our data. So, so um, you know, it, there may be fragmentation, but they want to still centralize and understand just the consumer and, and what they're using, um, and it will help them, especially as they, um, as marketers are really looking at cross-screen um, sort of journeys and a holistic view of the consumer across TV mobile, desktop, everything. They want to get a full view of that. How many times has a person seen my ad? And that is you know, what everybody is asking, no matter what, where they've seen it. Um, and then what was the impact of that? And so um, I, I think that um, a lot of um, TV or broadcast providers are, you know, they know the value of their audiences. And so they're starting to really kind of look at, OK, um, what do we provide to advertisers, but also how do we ensure that we're going to get the return that we want out of this? So. Um, I, I think, you know, if in 2002, I told you that, you know, that Nokia phone you're using, you're going to be doing your banking on that in 10 years' time. You're going to be editing film on that and, you know, uh, doing um, your homework on it. You would have thought, I'm, I'm crazy, right? So it, it, that's impossible. I think we haven't fully explored the relationship between the phone and the television. Um, the phone itself has incredible power um, to just actually become the full remote control, I think. Mm -hmm. You can see that you can link to on demand and project it to your screen, but you can't go into your photo album and just say, I'll quickly look at this and, and, and project it to your screen. I think that that will change, that link will grow. Um, and I also think that, you know, like when you're on YouTube and stuff, um, there's going to be a point where you can freeze frame, zoom in, extract information on objects in the scene, um, annotate that, you know, yourself, and that's going to give you incredible power. I mean, people are already addicted to their phones. This is going to make us more addicted, which raises a bigger question that we need to kind of look well, at. TV that. is ultimately a very social yeah. entertainment, right? Yeah. What was once the water cooler, now you've got people doing, you know, pre-show analysis to, you know, while it's happening, commentary, <laughs> post-analysis after you know, the Talking Dead and all this stuff and stuff. So yeah. there's all kinds of chatter that happens before, during, and after shows. I think exactly. it's a very inherently social medium. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I'm just really conscious of the, the, the organizers and I'm having to get into other comments and I'm conscious of my own needs for alcohol. So, uh, 
Could you give our wonderful panellists a round of applause for the